Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. Today I want to begin to explain systemic racism. My last video was about how systemic racism impacts all Black people living in America. I wanted to counter the claims by Candace Owens and others that racism is not real or that systemic racism only affects poor Black people, uneducated Black people, or Black people who have committed crimes. Since releasing that video, however, it's come to my attention that all of the people in my audience were not operationalizing racism or systemic racism in the same way. What I mean is we don't have a consensus on what racism is or if it even exists. This was something I definitely took for granted, but I want to take a step back and offer some thoughts on systemic racism so that uh, people can understand and better access other people's perspectives. Again, this is going to be in two parts. But before I get into it though, I just want to give you permission to stop this video. If you don't want to hear my opinion on what systemic racism is, you don't have to. It's completely okay. I have other fun videos on how I met my husband, on my homeschooling adventures with my kids, on how I planned my sister's surprise wedding. I even have a Beyonce music video parody that I did to celebrate the launch of my husband's new company. Racism is not the dominant theme of my life. My life is about supporting my family and building up my community by running my family's nonprofit foundation, by volunteering for my kids' soccer teams, volunteering at my son's school as a room mom. My YouTube channel is actually about those things. It isn't a social statement on identity politics related to race and class in 2020 in America. Or is it? But seriously, I don't have a political agenda, but that might be precisely why my perspective is interesting. If you do stick around, please understand that I'm not really about personal insults. I'm not angry, I'm not bitter, I'm not mean-spirited. I actually live a wonderful life in a very special country that I think has a lot of potential. And that is what my YouTube channel is about. I do have tough skin and a soft heart, which is why I even engage in these difficult conversations. But if you just want to hurl insults, save us all the time. I'm not going to hold your hurt for you. And another thing, please try not to project your assumptions about what my life experiences are onto the things that I'm saying. You would be surprised to know what my life is like, where I was raised, where my family's from, who my friends are what my educational background is, what I've accomplished, how much money I make, what my political leanings are, or what I've been through. So don't make up a story in your head about where I'm coming from, because you're probably totally wrong. And again, if something about this rubs you the wrong way, you don't have to listen to any of this. On the other hand, if you do stick around, you don't have to agree with me. Besides my family and my contributions to my community, one of the things I'm most proud of in my life is the diversity of thought in my social network. You don't have to look like me, think like me, love like me, pray like me, or be like me in any other kind of way to be my friend. You just need to be respectful, to be tactful, and to be optimistic. And if that's you, please stick around because there is a future in our friendship, despite what we agree on or don't agree on. Oh my God, this video is already getting so long and we have a big topic to tackle. Okay. Okay, so what is systemic racism? It's a big question. Remember, I'm going to be trying to break this down in two parts, but I actually wrote out my own definition of systemic racism so that people could understand what I'm talking about when I am saying the word systemic racism. To me, systemic racism is a combination of biased attitudes, assumptions, cultural norms, business practices, policies, and applications of rules and laws that maintain a disproportionate vulnerability for black people and other minorities. So you as an individual are part of a social ecology. There's you within your family, your family within a community, your community within a broader uh, governmental context, like either a country or some other kind of designation. So I tried to organize the system of racism by social ecological levels 
meaning attitudes and assumptions kind of start at the individual level, but cultural norms, business practices, policies, and the application of rules and law are relevant at the community level, the societal level, or the national level. The word system implies uh, interdependent or coordinated parts. So again, systemic racism is about the interactions of biased attitudes, assumptions, cultural norms, business practices, policies, and applications of the law that maintain a disproportionate vulnerability for Black people. Where there are racist individual people, there are racist social systems because people make up the social systems, both explicitly racist people and naive, implicitly biased people maintain systemic racism. Now, maintain is a really important word in my definition of systemic racism uh, because it's important to understand that racism in the United States is an undeniable historical fact. I do not need any statistics to prove that America has a history of racism. Under the law, Black people were not considered people, Native American people were not considered people, Asians were not considered people, even women were not legally considered people under the written law. So there's really no argument around the fact that the United States was founded on and prospered from systemic racism through the institution of slavery. America abolished slavery, not just for moral reasons, but largely for economic reasons. The Civil War was actually very narrowly won by the North. If you do a little research on the Civil War, you'll find out meaning that the decision to enfranchise black people was not the result of a cultural epiphany. It really just came down to a superior military tactic. People fought hard and died to maintain the oppression of black people and other minorities, and they were angry and resentful when they lost the Civil War. Okay, so I'm saying that losing the Civil War did not suddenly abolish systemic racism and make America fair. Uh, we have plenty of documentation of the atrocities that Blacks and other people face uh, and continue to face in this country. Um, and the civil rights movement was in response to the ongoing systemic racism despite the emancipation of the slaves. Just as with the Civil War, the signing of the Civil Rights Act did not magically cure Americans or American institutions of racism. And again, many Americans were actually very angry and resentful that the Civil Rights Act was signed. Or maybe I should say many Americans are actually angry and resentful that the Civil Rights Act was signed because it was just signed in the 1960s when President Donald Trump was around 18 years old and Vice President Joe Biden was in his early 20s. We are not even one generation from a legal attempt to hold people and institutions and organizations accountable for systemic racism. So there's definitely no way that enough time has passed for our attitudes and assumptions and cultural norms to have shifted significantly. Despite the enactment of the Civil Rights Act, human rights are still being debated in the court of personal and public opinion just how abortion has been legalized, but we don't all agree. Doctors who perform abortions have been murdered and abortion clinics have been burned down because people feel so vehemently and passionately that abortion is wrong, despite the fact that our legislation says that abortion is allowable. So I hope you see that from a temporal perspective, there's no logical pathway to claiming that systemic racism is over. Uh, the people who were against the Civil Rights Act and opposed the enfranchisement of Black people are still alive today and actually in positions of power. And many of them have not changed their hearts just because the law changed. And coincidentally, the day that I started drafting this, my pastor actually shared a clip from Pastor Rick Warren that I thought uh, was relevant. Let's change the atmosphere. Yeah. What a dream. Let's change the atmosphere. Come on. Racism is not a skin problem, it's a sin problem. And it's only going to change in the heart. Now we need laws, but laws will not change a bigot into a lover. They won't. Only Jesus can do that.
if I thought I could change people by making laws and that would change their motivation, I'd probably do that. But I have found that only Jesus Christ can change the people. I think we all know that it's difficult for people to change their minds on anything or change their behavior. And research shows that this is especially the case around attitudes related to race and social identity. In a study that I cited in my last ebook on parenting, I was explaining that uh, research shows that past age nine, it's really, really difficult for a child to change their ideologies about race and other kinds of social identities. It's really hard for them to change unless they have a life altering event. So what this means is that whatever someone thinks about racial hierarchies by age nine is pretty much the ideas that they're going to hold on to unless they have something really dramatic change their heart. So just thinking about the average age of our lawmakers and policymakers, we have to know that it would be really, really uh, overly optimistic to think that we have eradicated racism from our political, legal, social systems, as well as from our cultural norms and institutions. And the point of my last video was that we can't look at some outliers and pretend that that's sufficient evidence that systemic racism has disappeared. I said that racism is like a social cancer that affects all black people and we cannot use cancer survivors to argue that cancer is over or eradicated. People are still dying from cancer and people are still dying from racism. Um, it still exists in people's hearts and minds and it still exists within our culture and institutions and especially because our culture and institutions are comprised of people. And so when we see injustice towards a black person and a lack of accountability for that injustice, it's not something that's occurring in a historical vacuum. And I wanted to mention that, you know, kind of most importantly, I don't think the burden should be on me to prove that racism was a motivator. Given the history and culture of our country, the burden should be on anyone who feels differently to prove that this is not in any way related to social injustice in America because racism is the historical context here. So if you think a particular event is not part of that context, you're the one respectfully who has to prove your case. And I'm going to say given the disproportionate burden of social and health problems uh, on black people and other minorities, that we have ample data to support, you're going to have a hard time proving that uh, racism or systemic racism is over uh, through any kind of statistical analysis. So my final piece for this part one video is I just wanna take a few more seconds um, to address the recurring point that black immigrants have better outcomes, so systemic racism must be a myth. Uh, that argument also doesn't totally make sense. Uh, we don't actually have sufficient qualitative or quantitative data on the black immigrant experience, but I do have my own experience to kind of contribute to the emerging pool of data. Uh, both my father-in-law and my father are immigrants actually from West Africa. My dad has a completely distinct history and experience from other native black Americans. It doesn't make any sense at all to compare him who actually entered the United States with a perfect score on the SAT to advance his schooling at an Ivy League graduate school to the average African American who's the descendant of slaves who has had so many uh, options limited for him historically. My dad was not part of the social systems that are racist in America. Um, he still experienced racism in America, but he does not have a legacy of enslavement burdening him. And frankly, he's not subject to the exact same stereotypes and treatment because he's a recent immigrant. So from what I learned from my professor, Dr. Gary Okahiro, my dad's experience was much more like an Asian American immigration narrative than the commonly uh, told black American uh, experience. Another point that's commonly overlooked 
uh, in the immigrant experience is that immigrants procure an elevated social status in their home country, which can offset the perceived oppression in the host country. So what I mean is that even someone who's a taxi cab driver in New York is considered to have high social status back where they came from by sheer virtue of their disproportionate earning and the fact that they are in America. So again, this is anecdotal evidence, um, but there isn't a wide body of research. My point is that comparing uh, black immigrants to uh, black Americans uh, is like comparing apples and oranges, but my dad has still experienced racism in many forms. Uh, so we just have to try to stop collapsing the narratives. So I just want to stop here for part one by stating that systemic racism is a historical fact and there is insufficient evidence to claim that racism is over. And this is a point that probably could be elaborated a bit more, but I'm just gonna throw it out there just so that everybody knows that when you have statistics and we use science, we don't actually prove anything. We only fail to disprove something. So, you know, please be cautious about the way that you call statistics into your argument and try to integrate them into proving a point. Statistical data is different than historical evidence. I appreciate all of the dialogue that's happening underneath my posts. I um, just want to say it's hard for me to get back to everybody in a timely fashion. You know, like I said, this is not my career. I'm just lending some of the skills that I have for conceptual modeling and facilitating safe and productive conversations because um, I was a college professor for so long, uh, but hopefully this can evolve into a place where people feel safe um, to be constructive and share on these topics when I do post things related to this. So in part two that I will get to eventually, I will talk specifically about how systemic racism is operationalized. Um, it's operationalized through four processes, in my opinion, impacting options, opportunity, representation, and accountability. Um, so even in the context of systemic racism, black people still have options and opportunities, definitely. I'm a testament to this reality, but again, the fact that I have put systemic racism into remission in my life does not mean that this social cancer is eradicated. Um, so hopefully I'll get to part two soon. Um, thanks for watching.